This morning, Tara Stringfellow and Memphis, her debut novel. It's a multi-generational story about family, heartbreak, and moving forward. Stringfellow changed her entire life to throw herself into this book. What she's produced is both a tribute to her ancestors and to a city she adores. Memphis in May reminded him of Coolridge's Ode to Xanadu. Stately pleasure domes were massive plantation houses with wraparound porches on every tier, and the majesty of the Mississippi River could put to shame any sacredness of the elf. You've lived all over the world, but you keep coming back here. Yes. Yes, I mean, it's gorgeous. It, it Why is. live anywhere else in the world? <laughs> Tara Stringfellow grew up on a military base in Japan and has lived in Ghana, Cuba, Spain, and Italy. But it was in Memphis, where her family's been rooted for generations, that she wrote her first novel while working as a 10th grade teacher. It was the most beautiful moment of my life to share the book deal with my students so they could see in, in a classroom full of black students so they could see that you know the Success. love of, or the love of English right like I was literally teaching them how to love reading I said it will pay off promise it will pay off and then to actually experience that with them like wow this is the writing room this is it this is my girl <laughs> Memphis unfolds over the course of 70 years before and after race and poverty thrust this city to the forefront of the civil rights movement. It features three generations of black women, all steeped in Stringfellow's personal history. At the top is Hazel, the matriarch, and her husband Myron, the first black police detective in Memphis, just like Stringfellow's real-life grandfather. She calls this book the monuments he never got. Also, Hazel and Myron's daughters, Miriam and August, and their grandchildren, including Joan, who finds solace in painting. Are you Joan? Are you Miriam? Are you Maya? I, mean, I, was, I, I would say Joan, right? <laughs> Is that right? No. I feel like I'm all of them. Okay. Those parts were easy for me to write, her obsessiveness. But in some ways, I'm Maya, you know? I. I try and be funny. It's very rare. It happens only <laughs> occasionally on the most <laughs> inopportune of times. But sometimes I'm funny, and you know, I speak Italian. Parlo italiano, studiato italiano, e ho vissuto in Italia. So you know, I, you know, writing those parts where she was speaking Italian was just fun for me. I was like, yes, I get to write in my second language, basically. And then sometimes. You know, I want to be alone in my kimono with my cigarette in my house. So sometimes I'm Auntie August. You know, I feel yeah. like I'm all of the women. I also went through my own divorce and started over. You completely changed your life, upended I everything. I did. Because you couldn't live that way. Not a second longer. Stringfellow, who in her past life was a married lawyer, was raised around poetry which she says is still her one true love. You wrote your first poem ever to your dad. I did. And you say your last poem ever. Will probably be for him too. My first poem, my last poem. I just, you know, he taught me poetry. He's a poet. And he instilled in me a love of literature, of prose, of verse, of haiku, of Elizabethan sonnet, iambic pentameter. He taught, he taught it all to me at a very young age, so. He sounds awesome. A marine poet. Can yeah. you believe it? The is only he, reason he's not here is he's at the Pentagon right now working. For you, is he more marine or more poet? He's, he's my pops. He is my favorite person on this earth. Stringfellow never has to look far for inspiration. That includes a second edition copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, a gift from her mother, parts of which she's memorized. Gatsby saw that the blocks of sidewalk really formed a ladder that mounted to an invisible point somewhere beyond yeah. the trees. He could climb to it if he climbed alone, and once there he could suck on the path of life 
gulp down the incomparable milk of wonder. I do it? You did it. His heart beat faster and faster as Daisy's white face came up to his own. Daisy Buchanan. He knew that when he kissed this girl and forever wed his unutterable visions to her perishable breath, his mind would never romp again like the mind of God. Mmm, romp again like the mind of God. Get after it, buddy. I, I do have to say, Fitzgerald could write. He could write a sentence or two. You are done. He could write a sentence or two. Going straight. For a string fellow these days, nothing makes her heart beat faster or with more satisfaction than getting to be here in Memphis every day telling stories. I can't imagine a world in which I hadn't made the move. I just can't imagine a world in which I was Tara M. Stringfellow Esquire and not poet. I don't think my family would be happy for me, honestly. You, you wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be happy. But now you are. <sighs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's joyous. She is, she is so yeah. happy. Yes. I asked yeah. her whether she'd rather be writing or sitting out on the porch talking to neighbors, <laughs> which she dog. does every night, yeah. with Huckleberry. <laughs> she said, can I have my poetry notepad with right. me at the same time <laughs> on the porch? Um, so yeah, she's doing great, and she's just, I mean, she changed her life to do this. She and got after it, buddy. Yeah. She got she after it, buddy. She elicited something from you I've never seen before. She got after it. <laughs> that was awesome. It was. <laughs> great piece. <laughs>